Hey everyone, so after all this discussion about switches, I decided we should do a tutorial. So maybe quickly just to recap what we kind of what we kind of talked about was one, we have diodes. Right, we have to implement ideal switches with something real, some silicon device. We have diodes, they are one quadrant devices, right? They are able to you think about the IV characteristic. They can block negative voltage. Right, let's get, let's get the right color. They can block negative voltage. And they can conduct positive current. Right. And that's if you, you know, draw it like this, draw the diode like this, define this as the current ID, define this as the voltage VD, right? They're a one quadrant device that can do this thing. And you can flip them around to get the opposite quadrant or the the kitty corner, let's say. Cool. So we have diodes and then we also have MOSFETs, right? So we really only described kind of two devices. The MOSFET and the diode, the two quadrant and the one quadrant. Right, so again, the IV characteristic MOSFETs are able to block positive voltage and conduct both positive and negative current. They're current bidirectional devices, right? This is current unidirectional, you could say voltage unidirectional, this is voltage unidirectional, and current bidirectional. And of course, this is if, to, to give these positive and negative directions, we're gonna have to define the way the device looks, define, define the uh, voltages and currents. So if this is our power MOSFET, remember there's a body diode, usually we consider ID like this, this is the drain, this is the source, maybe we can just label that drain source gate, Maybe we can call this the cathode and the anode if you want to. Usually cathode, the symbol for the cathode is usually a K. Right, so we have ID and you can kind of think about VDS. VDS is the thing we're interested in. So basically using one and two, two quadrant devices, we can kind of do whatever we want, right? We, we're actually able to create uh, four quadrant devices using just MOSFETs or we're able to create like current unidirectional devices uh, with MOSFETs, like the, using these things, we can kind of group them together to create uh, different kinds of devices. So just for an example, we can make a four quadrant device out of two MOSFETs back to back. And actually there is a, I'm going to draw it like this. There, you have two choices, right? Of how you connect the body diodes. I'm gonna draw it like this. Again, I challenge you to think about why this is a good or a bad idea. It's kind of actually not that simple. And if we, if we kind of put a black box around this and consider say this as the positive V and you know, let's say this current I, this is still a current bidirectional device, but now you can apply both a positive and negative voltage and it can block both. And there's other ways of doing this. There's different ways of combining one and two quadrant devices to get the desired operation. Cool, so now that we have this, let's do an example. And the example I want to do is the buck, right? We've, we've talked about the buck a lot. Really, I'm just using this as like a foil to like understand really what's going on. It looks pretty simple, there's only a few components, but actually the deeper you look into it, the more complicated it gets. So let's, look at the buck, so this is kind of how we've drawn it before, right, with these ideal switches. And let's just remind ourselves of the plan of attack. So really what we're going to do, first step, look at required blocking voltages and conducting currents of each switch. Right, so we'll define some positive and negative voltage. Let's say, we'll call this VQ1. This is Q1. Here, I'll use different colors. 
So, you know, maybe, maybe we define some positive voltage like this. This is say VQ1, we have Q1 over here. And we could call this thing Q2, right? As we had before, maybe define this as VQ2, right? And given passive sign convention, what we typically use to define voltages and currents in devices, we'll say that this is uh, IQ1 and this is IQ2, right? Because we expect these kind of dissipate power, we expect the current to go into the positive terminal. That Again, this is just a, a choice. It could go, you could define it however you want. But once you have a choice, you better stick with it. So the first step is really look at voltages and currents of this. And the second step match up the requirements from one to select the appropriate switch. Right, so in this case, either a MOSFET or a diode. Appropriate, okay, I'll just say that's right. <laughs> as messy as it is, I'll, I'll just assume that that's correct. Cool, so that's our two-step process, right? So we analyze the converter, we define some voltages and currents for each switch, and then we say, oh, does it need to block positive voltage and conduct positive neg negative current? Well, then you throw a, a MOSFET in there, right? That's the kind of thing we're going to do. So, how do we do that? Well, again, we kind of always start this in the same way. we break it up into the two switching states. And yeah, switching TSW, right? So in the first switching state, Q1 is on, Q2 is off. So the circuit looks like this. Again, I'm gonna explicitly show you where Q1 and Q2 are so that we can think about the voltages and currents that are being applied to them. All right, so this is state one, this is in state two. So I know we did the, the boost at first, but again, you, as a homework problem, you could do the boost yourself, right? You could select switches for the boost yourself. But for now we're doing the buck because it's the buck, right? Cool, so let's, let's uh, think about the voltages and currents of Q1 and Q2. So we have Q1 and Q2. Now Q1 is on, so we care about the current. And Q2 is off, so we care about the voltage. Here, Q2, Q1 is off, so we care about the voltage. And Q2 is on, so we care about the current, right? And I've defined the current in that direction. I, Q2. Great. So, I mean, we've already analyzed. Maybe I should use several different colors. Okay. So, well, I'll start with VQ1. Or, sorry, IQ1. Excuse me. I'll start... I'll start with IQ1. So again, IQ1 points in this direction. And we've already analyzed the converter, so we know that IQ1 actually conducts IL1, right? Now, we're going to assume that this is operating in continuous conduction mode, which is, which is what we have been doing, but I haven't said it explicitly. So we're going to assume that the inductor current ripple is not larger than the average current ripple, which means that the inductor current should always be positive. Current is always going to flow from the load to the from the source to the load, right? So it's going to be always positive. And this is important, right? We have to know if if the current is both positive and negative. Great. And we can think about VQ2, right? Let's let's use green. VQ2. So what's VQ2 here? VQ2, well, it has to block VG, right? This is like the input VG, VG. I didn't label this super well, but maybe I probably should, just so you're familiar with what's going on, right? This is all the same stuff. This is V out. Great. So VQ2 has to block the input voltage VG. Now, VG, we're, like, we're going to assume that we were trying to convert a positive voltage. So again, we're not, we're assuming in a sense that the input voltage is always positive. All right, this is kind of maybe more baked into the application itself if VG is positive or negative, but if it's negative, then your circuit is gonna kind of look a little bit different. So you, you will have different considerations, but we're going to assume that it stays 
either positive or negative. In this case, we're saying we're assuming that it stays always positive. Great. So let's look at VQ1 now, right? So here, VQ1, this is a short, which means VQ1 must block VG. And again, it's always positive. And let's look at IQ2. And in this case, IQ2 conducts minus IL, right? This is IL flowing here. It means IQ2 conducts minus IL. And again, due to a similar argument for IQ1, if the ripple is smaller than the average, then IL should be always positive, so minus L, IL should always be negative. Cool. So we kind of have all the information we need right now, right? So let's uh, let's write this out. So for Q1, right, I'll use, I'll be more explicit with my colors, right? So Q1 is red, right? So for Q1, let's just draw out the uh, IV characteristic we need for this thing to operate. So we have V, we have I. Let's go back. So the current is always positive. Okay, that's good. And the voltage is, we have to block positive voltages. So in a sense, or not in a sense, explicitly, we have to conduct positive currents and we have to block, maybe I'll use blue as, I, as I've been using. And we have to block positive voltages. Now there are one quadrant devices that can do this explicit thing. But one thing I want to note is that this cannot be a diode, right? Not a diode. How do I know it's not a diode? Because the diode blocks negative voltage, right? So it could either the diode can either do this, this quadrant, or this quadrant. But it cannot do this quadrant or this quadrant. So that means that this cannot be a diode. The, our other option for a two-quadrant device is a MOSFET. Right, it has to be a MOSFET. So the MOSFET can do a little bit more than what we than what we need, right? The current can kind of flow backwards in the MOSFET. But we you could say that this is like below the, the capabilities. It's less than the capabilities of the MOSFET. So if we use a MOSFET, for sure it's going to work, right? So in this case, we need to use a MOSFET to satisfy these conditions, right? So and again, let's be uh, precise. So I'll, I'll first I'll draw just this shell part. And then think about the way we define the voltage. So the voltage points towards VG, right? So that means we need, uh, if it's blocking positive voltage, we need the body diode to point towards VG when it's off, right? Which means the body diode needs to point this way so that when it's off, it can block it, which means that that's the source, right? So this is the, this is the MOSFET that we need to use for Q1. Again, we could use some other devices which we haven't discussed, but for sure it can't be a diode. Great. Now let's look at Q2, right? So Q2, what were the requirements for Q2? Well, it has to block a positive voltage, right? The way we've drawn here. And it has to conduct a negative current. So let's draw out the IV curve for that. Okay, well, we have V, we have I. So it has to block a positive voltage and conduct a negative current, right? The current is always negative. Cool, okay, so again, we could use a MOSFET here, right? Because the MOSFET can block both positive and negative voltages or block or conduct both positive and negative currents. However, we could use another device, right? So if you recall, the diode, as we were discussing here, can either occupy this quadrant or this quadrant, depending on the direction it's pointing. In this case, the diode is able to do this. So this is kind of like the diode is able to exactly satisfy the requirements of this switch. So just by matching it up with what we know the diode IV characteristic looks like, right? It looks like this. It can either be on this side or alternatively, if you flip it around, it could be on this side, right? Those are the two quadrants it can occupy. We know just by matching it up that this is a diode. 
So really, the, the trickiest part with this is actually making sure you have the orientation of the switch correct, right? That That's kind of the the trickiest part because otherwise you're just matching shapes to shapes basically that that's kind of the the power of this kind of solution is that it's really just pattern matching it makes it really easy to understand what you should use and and ev eventually you'll kind of just get an intuitive feeling for what's going on but let's put these devices into our buck just to see what this looks like. All right, so. Q1 is a MOSFET. The body diode of the MOSFET points towards the input source, right? Great, so this is this is Q1. We, impl we implement Q1 with a MOSFET. In this case, I'm choosing an N-channel MOSFET. Q2. We implement with a diode. So let's be careful with what we need the diode to do. It needs to block a positive voltage, right? So, or it's blocking a positive voltage in this direction. It's conducting a negative current. Diodes can only conduct current in one direction. So you can kind of figure out that because the current needs to go from the ground up to the inductor, that the diode has to point from <laughs> the ground to the inductor. And we just continue on drawing our buck, right? We still have L. And we still have C. And then we have our load, which we're representing with a resistor. So this is a little bit closer to how we might implement a buck, right? We have L, we have C, we have our load. And we have our switches. So again, I've chosen an N-channel MOSFET, which is actually a little bit problem problematic for the for like controlling it, because we have to drive we have to provide we have to provide a positive gate source voltage, right? If we can think about think back to our discussion on MOSFETs, we have to provide some positive gate source voltage. And if you notice, the source is actually connected to some floating node, right? It's connected to the VX node, right? This is the VX node. So this is actually not so straightforward to do, and often people will use actually PMOS if they're using a buck like this with the diode because the because the PMOS can be turned on more easily even though it's floating. So again, some, something extra to think about. But what I also want to point out is that exactly one switch in this two switch device, uh, two switch circuit is controlled, right? So we have control. All we're doing is turning this single switch on and off. And this is all the control we need. And then the diode Right, so if we, this is like VGS. The diode responds naturally, we could say. When the MOSFET turns on, you kind of reverse bias the diode. And then when, when the MOSFET turns off, the current through the uh, inductor kind of forces the diode to turn on. More specifically, the VX node begins to drop. You can imagine that there's some parasitic capacitance here, right? The diode has some parasitic capacitance. The inductor current actually discharges this, the capacitance at the VX node. And when the uh, voltage of the VX node drops below the forward voltage drop of the diode, the diode uh, turns on. So the inductor current discharges parasitic cap at VX below VF, right? So it has to go below VF, turning on the diode. So we can kind of, we can, we can draw this actually. So when, when the MOSFET turns off, let's, uh, so we can imagine that the inductor current is rising up and then falling back down and then rising back up. This is what the inductor current is doing. And in this moment, right when we turn off the MOSFET, the VX node, which I'll draw in green, right, so here the VX node is VG, the VX node discharges. 
It's discharged by this inductor current. And it discharges to minus Vf, right? We have to apply some negative voltage to forward bias this diode. So we go to minus Vf to turn on the diode, and then it stays at minus Vf until the MOSFET turns back on. When the MOSFET turns back on, uh, basically there's an inrush of current through the MOSFET, which charges, basically provides the reverse recovery charge for the diode, right? So we have some inrush of current, reverse biasing, again, the MOSFET, or the, the diode, charging this back up, and then returning this back to VG. So the VX, so VG, VX, the VX node, in a very precise way, goes from VG to minus VF, minus the forward voltage drop, and then back to VG. And then it repeats. So there's, there's this transition between this turning on, the MOSFET turning on Q1, and the diode turning on Q2. And this slow change in the VX node kind of has to happen because we need to forward and reverse bias this diode. So that's kind of like the, the uh, maybe you, you might call this an asynchronous buck for reasons we'll get into later. But this is not the only way uh, you can make a buck. And if you recall, I said before that a diode works here, but also we could use a MOSFET. That's possible, and a lot of people do it. This is a very common thing to do, is to use a MOSFET here instead of a diode. And the reason people would do that is because you can see here, when the MOSFET, or when the diode is conducting, we're forced to have a minus VF, right? Which can result in a lot of conduction loss. So a MOSFET might be better for conduction loss purposes. But for simplicity, and for different modes of operation, often the diode is, is quite good, quite suitable. Cool, so that's kind of all I have for today. And the next lecture, the next thing we're going to talk about is DCM. So, And I, in, I did this kind of specifically. So we introduced switches because switches are kind of integral to understanding discontinuous conduction mode. So th this, this thing is called discontinuous conduction mode. And it's kind of in contrast to continuous conduction mode, which is what we have been studying. This is what we've been studying so far, so converters in continuous conduction mode. Again, I didn't really introduce it specifically because I didn't want to make it confusing, but this is, we've kind of been making this assumption this whole time. And I'm going to introduce this kind of new, new thing, discontinuous conduction mode. Cool, thanks.